Hi, my name is Kelly English, and today, and I'm from the Arthritis Research Canada's Patient Advisory Board. Today, I'm here with the Arthritis Patient, um, the Arthritis Broadcast Network. Sorry, it's early in the morning, and I'm talking to Dr. Van Van Vandela, um, oh, Alu Alia. Yes. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. I practiced that ahead of time, but I got it a bit wrong. Who's the corporate chief of rheumatology at William Osler Health System Center and the president of the Canadian Rheumatology Association? So, thanks for being with us today and taking the time out of your, I know, very busy schedule. Pleasure to be here. So, are you a practicing rheumatologist as well as um, with the organization and the the models of care and stuff like that. Yes, correct. Actually, I'm uh, the past corporate chief of the William Osler Health System. Okay. So, um, but I'm a Canadian rheumatologist. I work in Brampton, and I um, I work full time in addition to doing some of the work for the CRA. <laughs> I know that the patient reviews were really high. Oh, I okay. know <laughs> that I was specifically looking for that. So, um, a little bit about yourself and why you chose rheumatology. Oh, well, that's an interesting question. That goes back quite a little while. I've been in practice for about 25 years. I um, trained at the uh, University of Toronto Medical School and also the University of Toronto Rheumatology, well, Internal Medicine and Rheumatology Program. Right. And there was a particular. Um, um, physician, Dr. Keystone, you might know, yes. who inspired me when I was doing my internship and I thought rheumatology was the coolest thing ever. And you know, at that time, we didn't have a lot of medications. For no, patients. I was in at that point. There was not exactly. much at all. We had aspirin, we had um, corticosteroids, we had methotrexate. And we had rest and exercise and ice and heat and those kinds of things. And, and things have come quite a long way in rheumatology. Surprisingly, I think we're probably one of the specialties that has the best progression in treatment options in, compared to other kinds of uh, subspecialties. I agree. In yes. the last 24 years, yes. it's amazing how fast things have taken off. Correct. Due in part, which we'll talk about next, um, to all the work, the hard work that the CRA and the rheumatologists have done. Um, so tell me about being, what's it like being on the president of the CRA? Um, it's busy. <laughs> it's uh, busier than I thought it would be. It's been a wonderful two years. I have a fantastic board of directors and uh, a wonderful, skillful CEO. So it's kind of made my life a little bit easier uh -huh. when we have a board that's um, thinking in the same way and on the same wavelength and uh, concerned about moving the organization forward. So our board used to be um, an operational board where okay. all the committee chairs would come and report and we would listen to those reports and things like that. That's all taken over by the CEO because we change now to a strategic board. And in that sort of situation, we actually have time to understand what the future is for our members. So we're creating some, we've created actually some strategic priorities that is going to benefit our membership moving forward, but we can actually look into the future and make some uh, recommendations and changes for members' needs and wants in the future, which we really couldn't do before. Right. Because we were busy. Because you were busy. Busy doing you know, everything else. Exactly. <laughs> and so that's all taken over by the operational committees and the committee chairs and the CEO. And he comes to the board and gives a report as to what's happening. But the board is very uh, forward thinking. So I think that's been really great. And what do you see as the future of rheumatology? I mean, we've made a lot of changes. Yes. But obviously, we're still on that road to change. Yes, exactly. So I think um, research takes high priority. And I think that research landscape has changed, perhaps in Canada, maybe in, even in the US. And a lot of the research tends to be done in, in areas where um, it's less expensive. So I think bringing research back and, and thinking about a collaborative environment in terms of all of the institutions that support research can certainly make a difference. I think you're, I think 
that's sort of what I have gotten out of both the American College of Rheumatology Conference and out of this one this time. I was with the research, uh, the new research conference yesterday. Oh, okay, wonderful. Well, it's yeah. interesting to hear people talking about scleroderma, for example, and yes. psoriatic arthritis, but combined with some of the other disciplines. Yeah. Um, cardiovascular rheumatology clinics. I mean, that was a new one to me. True. Uh, True. And these multidisciplinary clinics are very helpful for patients who have multiple different uh, organ involvement. And this is definitely something new to me. Yeah. Um, I don't think anyone in the States goes to a, you know, even knows about that in a lot of areas. It could be. Yep. Very impressive. Yep. Yeah. And that is started in Ontario. Some of those uh, things, uh, these kinds of clinics have started in Ontario, although, you know, there are sort of co-management clinics, dermatology and, um, and rheumatology, for right. example, psoriatic arthritis, or um, uh, thrombotic conditions and lupus, right. you know, because exactly. sometimes they go together and stuff. So you get the, if you're in an academic center, you're going to get the best of both worlds. That's right. That's right. And um, not a care in Ontario. There's lots of changes in Ontario, and of course, being a big province, sometimes they kind of lead to other provinces. True. Well, we also have a um, very effective organization, a provincial organization in Ontario called the Ontario Rheumatology Association, of which I'm past president as well. Right. <laughs> I noticed so, that. <laughs> um, it's kind of... That's, uh, that's kind of uh, catapulted me to the national uh, sphere. But um, the organization is very um, effective, very vocal at the ministry level, um, and it, it does quite a bit for our members. Now, every province doesn't have the complement of physicians that we have in Ontario, considering that we have about 200 rheumatologists. Right. Most of the other provinces have less than half maybe a quarter. So in, in that sort of situation, the Ontario Rheumatology Association can do more. Um, and um, and it, it's, it's doing a, a lot of things that are um, helpful for members locally. I also noticed um, we have a member of our board who is a advanced clinical physiotherapist. Mm -hmm. And she said that in Ontario, because she's been in BC as well, in Ontario, you have a wonderful model of care that you can send to clinics with physiotherapists. It's quite different. Well, exactly. So actually, for the last 10 years, I've done research on these extended role providers, we call yes. them. So they're either physios or occupational therapists, and now the program is also accepting nurses. Um, it's offered out at St. Michael's Hospital, and it's called the ACPAC program, which is exactly That's what you're the word I'm looking for. And what they do is they have to have at least five years of experience in their field, and then they can go to this program, and they, um, they learn about orthopedic and rheumatological conditions for an entire year, and it really raises the bar in terms of what they know. So they come and they work either with orthopedic surgeons or the hip and knee replacement centers, or they work with rheumatologists to increase capacity to see patients, because you know access to care is a huge problem, it's because huge. in rheumatology we are quite underserviced. It's huge. Yes, yeah. so they are helping support us in many different ways to increase the capacity where we see patients. Now in our office we're doing another study looking at managing comorbidities, making sure all vaccinations are up to date, making sure patients have bone densities, looking at cardiovascular health, because that being, is an increased uh, issue around patients with inflammatory diseases. So the, our therapist is going to be working with the patients to help them uh, deal with those issues. Perfect. Yes. yes. I know Claire Barber has been doing some work around quality of care. Correct. Out of Alberta. Yeah. Right. On right. one of her teams. That's so, right. And I've worked with Claire Barber on many projects as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You're in a wonderful field. You're so fortunate. Yes. I must admit, we appreciate. So, um, what are your thoughts about this year's meeting theme, 2020 vision, uh, a new decade? Where do you see the research and care going from here? So, um, I think it's a fantastic theme. We're entering a new decade. Um, lots of things are changing. And I think it's important for our organization to stay abreast of all of those things, whether it be pharmacogenetics, you know, which drug is right for which patient, whether it has to do with the technology aspect, whether it has to do with models of care, I think it's going to be a great decade. 
I agree. So, and leading to that same thing, we've got another decade. Uh, we have had a shortage of rheumatologists, and we know that there could be another shortage coming up due mm -hmm. to um, retirement mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and heavy loads and things like that. Do you see that changing a little bit in Ontario? Uh, so I, I think, yes, because we've done uh, a survey called Stand Up and Be Counted. Right. That was done a few years ago uh, by Claire Barber. I and, and she looked at the rheumatology manpower. And the thing is that 10% um, of our um, physicians thought that they would be retiring in the next 10 years. Lots of people who say they're retiring don't always retire, right? <laughs> when it comes close to that, that yes, it comes close to that, it's like, maybe I'll do another few years. So, I mean, that's what they had reported in the survey. But I think that um, it's interesting. It's not absolutely clear whether we have don't have enough rheumatologists, we don't have them in the right places. Right? I can see that. So that's a that's something we have to understand better. The other thing is that um, we we can use um, the other technology, virtual care, to see patients. And sometimes those ACPAC therapists we're talking about are in these underservice areas and they are with the patient. And the, they can communicate with the rheumatologist. And maybe we just have to change the, the way we deliver the care. I think that's show, shown up in the last, oh, even just three years, where we now are using technology to look at a person's skin yes. in, in conjunction with a nurse practitioner, say, exactly. or whatever. We have, a, a, I think, a unique problem in, in Canada mm -hmm. in that we have a large, larger rural area, mm -hmm. northern rural. Correct. Um, so you're a long way. It's not just a matter of driving to your car to a clinic. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully that will help them because I know I've got a couple of people already have asked me about um, how we're serving, how we're looking at serving the remote. Mm -hmm. So there are traveling rheumatologists that go out to the remote areas and sometimes they go with the extended role provider. So when there's two of them, then they can certainly see a, a lot more patients. Right. Yes, and, and they share the care. And also take a load off those rheumatologists too. Yeah. Might want to dial back just a little bit. Yeah. I can yeah, see exactly. that. Uh, so, let's say I'm a brand new patient. What would your lifestyle tips for me for living well with rheumatoid arthritis? Oh. Well, we heard a little bit about that yesterday with Tim Spector okay. and the um, microbiome and how many viruses and bacteria and fungi you have normally growing in your, um, in your gut that we don't realize and it can change depending on the food that you eat. So it's interesting. So we did try to pin him down to say, you know, what kind of anti-inflammatory foods are out there? He, he felt that processed foods were something that we should try and avoid as much as possible. Um, of course, sugary foods are something that one should avoid. Increase the fiber in your diet and try to eat the, the freshest uh, vegetables and plant-based food that you can add in your diet, you know, that you can get locally. Makes sense to me. Yes. So shop the outside of the grocery store. Don't shop the inside. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's <laughs> a good way to live by. Cereals. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And Nina, have we got any questions from our audience? Uh, we have one comment that says, I read that Dr. Aluaria is involved in electronic medical records adoption in Ontario. What are the benefits of EMR systems in rheumatology? Oh, I love that question. <laughs> that is a good question. Thank you for that. So, um, yes, yeah, so I spent um, about five to seven years transitioning all of the rheumatologists in Ontario to electronic medical records when I was president of the ORA, Ontario Rheumatology Association. <laughs> that was a big job. <laughs> you are a saint. <laughs> well, that was a big job. Well, the thing was that the Ontario MD. They are a subsidiary of the Ontario Medical Association and they were supporting doctors to move to electronic records because there are so many benefits of oh. moving to electronic records. We used to have to call the lab to say, the patient had some blood work done, but we didn't get it. We used to have to call uh, hospital records and find you know, films and go to the film library and they would pull the film out and we would look at it and stuff. That can all be done electronically now. So you can get lab reports, you can go to the central lab and the patient comes in and says, my family doctor just did blood work yesterday. I said, I can pull it out 
and I don't have to repeat it. You know how there was lots of repetition because we didn't have the results. Now we also get reports like x-rays and CT scans and MRIs forwarded directly into our system. They're filed directly. Administrative costs are down because all the filing is done electronically. And when we see the patient, I also created these forms that allows us to, um, you know, uh, direct the care to improve the quality of care. You know, we were talking about quality right. of care. So if we have all the important components of care that we've added to the care package, then we can also assess how your practice is doing. So we can say, well, do we miss any patients who are on steroids and didn't get a bone density? Let me do a, a run of uh, a report on that, or let me have a dashboard that's going to help me improve the care that I deliver. Right. So those are all things that we can do with electronic medical records, which you can't do with paper charts. That's for yeah, sure. Absolutely. So it's, it's, it's a benefit for all. And for patients who are concerned about their privacy, what would you say to them? So I think um, the government really takes privacy very seriously. And we want to ensure that all of that is, is um, managed according to the laws and ensuring that uh, all of your information remains as confidential as ever. Which is really reassuring. Exactly. Yeah. Anything else at the moment, Maria? Well, thank you so much for talking to me. It's been my pleasure. It was very interesting. Great. Yeah. It's always interesting to compare BC to Ontario to the rest of the world, but also to find out what the CRA has up their sleeve. For yes, exactly. Thank you. You're welcome.